Now, in my last sermon, we learned that God is holy. If you have missed our part one of God is holy sermon, visit our website www.riverchurch.com to listen to it. Let me read for you Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 to 4. It was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty saraphs, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their face, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. How grand and how magnificent and splendid is this vision that Isaiah had received. And there were mighty saraphs attending to God. These six-winged heavenly creatures known as the saraphs were worshipping God by proclaiming the characteristics of God to each other. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with His glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with His glory. And once again, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with His glory. And they kept reciting and proclaiming who God is. And yes, our God is holy. He is Kadosh. Who compares with you among gods, O God? Who compares with you in power, in holy majesty, in awesome praises, wonder-working God? No one for God, you alone, is fully God and entirely holy. God, you are all good, all pure and righteous and perfect without fault, without even a tiny spot of blemish. None can be compared to you. You are the Lord of heaven's armies, the Lord of hosts. You are the true God, the supreme God who rules the heaven and the earth. God, we declare your supremacy over the universe. You are the God who was and the God who is and the God who is to come. There is no one like our God and God is holy. Shout it out. Tell someone, our God is holy. And it's in the presence of our holy God that Isaiah experienced a profound consciousness of his fallen state. A sense of ruin and despair consumed him. Isaiah felt his ruin because he recognized and acknowledged his sin. At his confession, the divine cleansing and forgiveness took place. Isaiah chapter 6 verses 5 to 7 continue to read, Then I said, I, I, in this case, Isaiah said, It's all over. I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live among people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king, the lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the saraph flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, See, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. I really love the Bible for the word is never one dimensional. It is living and depending on what God has to say, the word comes to life in different ways. The word of God is living. The same word can speak to us differently in different seasons of life. You would have now noticed that there is an angelic creature that has been mentioned in chapter 6 of Isaiah, the Saraph. According to records, saraphs were limited primarily to Isaiah's vision. Another reference possibly made to the saraphs is likely from Revelation chapter 4, but what's not specifically clear. Nonetheless, what are saraphs? As, re as read in Isaiah chapter 6, they are supernatural or angelic beings, similar to what we call the cherub. All right. They are more well-known and mentioned in the Bible. The Saraf means the burning ones, the fiery ones. These burning ones are said to surround above the king as he sat upon his throne. According to Isaiah chapter 6 verse 2, these mighty Saraphs were attending to the Lord as he sat on his throne. 
The mighty Saroffs each has six wings, two to cover their face, another two to cover their feet, another two they flew with. What an interesting description. Don't you think so? Why do these angelic creatures have to cover both their face and feet? Well, for one very simple reason, because our God is holy. I love the sun. Walking or running in the open space under the warm sun is something I enjoy tremendously. Walking under the warmth of the sun allow me to contemplate the vastness of God's creation. Try taking a stroll in a park or the garden one day and just being mindful of your surrounding. Enjoy the warmth of the sun and the wondrous creations of God. You will understand what I mean. Looking up the sky, seeing the clear blue sky with the cottony like white clouds calm my mind greatly. Every now and then, I will attempt a very futile behaviour and that is to gaze upon the sun. I will never be able to lift my eyes towards the sun without lifting my hands to shield the strong glare. Even with my hands covering my eyes from the glare, they can never be opened wide towards the sun not even to mention to stare straight at it. The glory of the Lord is many, many, many times more glorious and dazzling. The holy presence of the Lord saturates the entire temple and the earth. In the infinite glory of the eternal Jehovah, even these angels must veil themselves. With two wings they covered their face, the holiness of God is so magnificent that even the burning Saroth who themselves are glowing in brightness must come before the Lord of Heaven's armies, covering their face with their wings, adoring our holy God in total humility. Come on church, tell someone, our God is holy. Say to someone, I am humbled in the presence of His holiness. Yes, I am humbled in the presence of His holiness. Not only did the Saraphs cover their face with their wings, but they also covered their feet with their wings. In the house of the Orient, shoes and sandals were never worn. This was especially so in the house of God. Removing footwear and bearing our naked feet when we enter the house of God for prayers shows reverence to our holy God. Our feet travel places and our footwear gets soiled and defiled. Our footwear come into contact with the common ground and therefore when we enter the temple of God, we remove our footwear to signify that the house of God is set apart. The place of worship is not common ground. It is the place where our holy God is lifted up. In the place, it is the place where God is exalted and glorified. The temple of God is holy ground. Furthermore, in most Eastern countries, Covering the lower parts of the bodies all the way to the feet with their long garments is decency. To appear in public with their lower body and feet covered is respect. The Saraphs were covering their face and their feet with their wings. This revealed that they have this deep sense of awe and devotion to God because they recognize the perfect holiness of our God. Even the Saraphs trembled while they gazed upon the Lord. They revered God with such humility and adoration. What more should men adore God? When God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, Moses saw that though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. At the amazing sight, Moses decided to go closer to look. And before he could come nearer, the Lord called out to him from the middle of the burning bush. He warned Moses not to come any closer without taking off his sandals, for he is standing on holy ground. When Moses heard this, immediately he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. In the presence of the holy God, Moses' natural response is to veil his face out of godly fear. He has to bare his feet to remove all defilement before entering the holy presence of God. Today, as you enter into God's holy presence, I pray that you will give our holy God the reverence he deserves. You will enter into his presence with humility, with awe, with godly fear, and with great reverence. That you will not take what he regards uncommon as common. 
you will come to meet with our holy God with face veiled and feet covered, giving Him your worship, worship that is due to our holy God. Besides covering the face and the feet with the four wings, the Saroths have another pair of wings. This, according to the Bible, is used to fly. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 2 says, Attending him were mighty Saroth, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. The word attending in Hebrews is Ahmad. It has several, several root meaning, and one of which is to stand, a position of readiness. It means to be ready to be employed by the Lord. And with two wings, the Saraf respond to the call of the Lord swiftly. Worshipping our holy God is to be always ready for His call, to be willing to be swift and to be prepared to answer His call. A life as a Christian, one that has been forgiven and transformed by God can never stay static and immobile. When Isaiah has been forgiven of his sins and found released from his guilt, he heard the voice of the Lord asking, Whom shall I send as the messenger to this people? Who will go for us? And without any hesitation, Isaiah volunteered. He said, Here I am. Send me. A servant of God who has experienced God's grace and forgiveness can never walk away without active service. Neither can one who has been redeemed, whose life has been redeemed, will, continue, will, will, not, will not continue to live without reverent awe. One that has been redeemed will continue to live with the sense of deep devotion and contemplation of His holiness. Like the Saraf, our life should always be in active service. Like the Saraf, our life should always give God our reverent adoration and humble devotion. Because God is holy. And because our God is holy, we live our life in both reverent devotion and active exertions. It is the life of Mary combined with that of Martha. Say to someone, I live my life in both reverent devotion and active exertions. The Saraf did not veil their face and cover their feet in humility and reverent adoration that they forget to flap their wings in execution at the commission of God. Neither did the Saraf fly without veiling their face and covering their feet. Many of us run to and fro in active service for the Lord. God is pleased with your service. Just like Martha, who is always swift in attending to the things of the Lord and to the matters in the house of the Lord, God is pleased. But it is even more important that you do not forget the one whom you are serving, that you do not neglect going to the Lord in humble and reverent worship, that you do not forget why you are doing what you are doing. You do not become so com consumed with the service that you forget your lover, the one whom you are doing all this for. Remember that your active service is not a substitute of your personal relationship with God and adoration for Him. It is not a cover-up for your lack of devotion and love for the Lord. It is not a way to masquerade the lukewarmness of, our, of your heart. God is holy and He deserves our humble and reverent worship. Just like the Saraf calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. God wants our heart of worship as well as our service. As for some of us, we are like Mary, who constantly remain at the feet of Jesus, fervent in his teaching, devoted in building our personal relationship with the Lord. This the Lord is pleased. But can I remind you that you do not fall into the trap of just merely filling your lamp with oil without shining your light before men. We are faithful in studying the word and praying each day. Our worship is genuine. We truly believe that God is holy. We acknowledge God is infinite. But we become so consumed with the hallelujahs that we take for granted not to move our wings of actions. We are engrossed in our contemplative, devo contemplative devotion and become too comfortable at the feet of Jesus that we become inactive for His work. 
and we masquerade our non-execution by our pious sounding language prayers and talks. We cover up our complacency with lofty plans and talks, but not real actions for God. In Isaiah chapter 29, Isaiah on behalf of God was pronouncing judgment on Jerusalem. The Lord says in verse 13, This nation approaches me only with their words and honors me only with their lip service. But they remove their hearts far from me and their reverence for me is a tradition that is learned by route without any regard for its meaning. Our running around and our pious sounding language in prayers and talk are meaningless to God when our heart is far away from Him. We try to give the impression that we are close to God with our acts of service, but we are merely going through the motion. Religion has become routine instead of real. We slip into routine patterns when we worship and we neglect to give God our true love and devotion that He deserves. My friends, our God is holy. Our holy God deserves the highest glory. The highest glory that come that we can give to our holy God is a life of reverent devotion and active execution. We must be like the Saraf, attending, always attending to God, always tearing, always ready to take up positions at His call and commission, always prepared to execute, yet never fail to worship and adore God in reverence and humility. Know when to move for God and when to cease moving. It is not one or the other. It is all at the same time. The six wings of the Saraf act in synchrony. Are your wings acting in synchrony for our holy God? What is the Lord saying to you today? Well, there are still some of us who lie hidden from God's call despite having received His grace and mercy. When God asks, Whom shall I send? We kept quiet and conceal our silence under the adoration and active execution of others. My friends, God has assigned to each of us a certain position in life. The Saraf are in their positions, hovering above the Lord, ready to attend to God's command. Are you in your position? What is God saying to you? My friends, God has, instruct and God has entrusted to each various resources, time, abilities and influences. And it is with this that we are to diligently promote the cause of God to the world. In our busy path through life, we need to seize the opportunities to preach the gospel. Regardless of the position we are called to, every position involves its peculiar responsibilities and even troubles. But we must be cheerfully and diligently fulfilling the responsibilities and overcoming the troubles that come with the position. When Isaiah took on the mission, he has no idea what the mission was about. He has no details about what he was supposed to do yet. He did not defer his response to God when God asked. Serving God these days is different. When told that there is a need in church and the church is looking for someone to fill the gap, we ask for details. We need to know what it encompasses. We need to know if we are up to the task. We need to pray about it. We have to check our schedule to see if we could accommodate God's work. My friends, please don't get me wrong that if you have done any of what I've just mentioned, you are less godly or unholy. But what I'm saying is that we have lost the childlike faith when responding to God's call. When God, when God asks, Whom shall I send? Without hesitation, Isaiah say, Hear Lord, now, this very moment, I am available. Think about your children when they are in kindergarten or preschool. When the teacher asks, Who can help me today? Without hesitation, almost every single kid will jump up, raising their hands high and shouting in excitement, Me, me, teacher, I can help. Do they really know what kind of help is the teacher needing today? Do they really care about the details? No, they are only concerned in pleasing the teacher by being the help he or she needs. To the children, it is an honor to be singled out by their teacher to run the errands. They are proud that the teacher has called upon them to take on any task. My friends, not tomorrow, 
not another day, but now, here, this very moment. Tell the Lord, I am available. Here I am. Send me, Lord. I am willing to take each day as a new challenge to go for you, for it is an honour to serve our holy God. After Isaiah's courageous and instantaneous volunteering, the Lord replied to Isaiah saying, Yes, go and say to these people. Now, let's pause here for a moment, my friends. Don't be taken aback at what you are going to hear next. The Lord continues, Say to these people, Listen carefully, but do not understand. Watch closely, but learn nothing. Harden the hearts of these people. Pluck their ears and shut their eyes. That way they will not see with their eyes and not hear with their ears nor understand with their hearts and turn to me for healing. What a strange and sad mission that God has set Isaiah up against. It must have astounded and saddened him to receive a mission that is so daunting. Isaiah is to go and say to the people, Listen, but do not understand. Watch closely, yet learn nothing. He is to make the mind, the minds of these people dull, their ears deaf and their eyes blind, so that they cannot see or hear or understand, and so they won't turn around and be made whole. What is going on here? This is so contradictory to the characteristics of God. For both the messenger and the receivers, this entire mission does not make any sense. For the messenger, it is a demoralizing and discouraging task. Has anyone tried herding cats like how a shepherd tries to herd their flocks of sheep? This means trying to round cats up and then direct them all to move orderly towards a specific direction. The cat lovers among us will probably understand that this is an uphill task. Cats are very individualistic animals. It will never be easy to organize them. They love to wander around at their own pace and have their whims and fancies. Herding cats is as good as whipping a dead horse and hope it will move and work. It sounds like Isaiah's every effort is going to amount to nothing. It looks like he is wasting his effort, knowing that there is no chance of succeeding. It seems a waste of time without a positive outcome. It seems like his effort is going to be futile. That's exactly how it feels regarding this mission. This mission. For the receiver, it sounds like God is forbidding them from coming to him. If I read the scripture in a shallow way, it seems to indicate that the reason God has sent Isaiah is to prevent the people from coming to him. Now, my friends, do you know when was the toughest when it comes to saying no? The very first time when you have to decline someone. Imagine that you have been asked by a guy for a date for the first time. He is a nice chap and has always been very kind and helpful towards you. Very sincere and genuine person but you are unwilling to go on a date with him. And to reject him for the first time can be one of the toughest things to do. You felt bad that you have to refuse him. You are in a little dilemma considering that both of you have always had a cordial relationship and friendship. You didn't think he deserves such a harsh rejection without giving him a chance. But your heart is telling you that you are really not keen to go out on a date with him. But once you have overcome the first no, the subsequent no's become much easier to execute. Your heart becomes hardened towards this guy and to a point you no longer feel sorry having to reject him. You might even reach a point of disgust with, this, with his persistence. This is what happens to the people in Isaiah chapter 6. If a man resists God's gracious invitations once, he finds it easier to resist a second time, third time, and gradually the influence will no longer have any persuasive effect on him. Isaiah is to keep saying the message, but the people will keep rejecting, and each time they do so, their hearts harden further, their ears become more immune to the message, their eyes become dimmer. 
This means the people could not see, could not hear, and could not understand because they have chosen, uh, chosen, chosen not to because not because God has forbidden has for, has forbidden them to to receive, to return, and be healed. This is the kind of mission God wants Isaiah to undertake. God wants Isaiah to go and preach the message of repentance to the people of Judah, even though the process is going to be daunting and disheartening. Even though the people are going to discontinue, is going to continue to rebel, to resist, and keep on turning away from God. We may ask, why God? Well, because our God is holy. And because He is holy, He is just. He cannot tolerate sin, nor will He allow it to go unaccounted for. Yes, our God is compassionate and gracious. He is slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. You see, my friends, God is loving, but He is not more loving than holy, and not more holy than loving. He is as holy as He is loving. And because He is holy and just, He cannot simply ignore sin. If He does, this would render Him less than perfect. He cannot allow sin because our holy God is perfect and without fault. He is all good, all pure and righteous. Yes, our God is loving, which leads to forgiveness. Our God is holy and just, which leads to God's judgment of sins. And because God is loving, holy and just, he is also merciful. Therefore, he is sending Isaiah to keep, to keep preaching the message, to forewarn the people. But sadly, the people will not understand. They will learn nothing. Their hearts will harden. Their ears and eyes will be shut from the message. They will not hear nor see, and their mind will be dark to, the, to receive the message. When a man rejects your teaching, he cleaves more to his sins and errors more passionately than he would previously. He is hardened. He is blinded. He is deafened to the message. Not because he can't see, but he won't see. And because he won't see, all this time, a time will come that he shall no longer be able to see anymore. He will no longer be responsive anymore to the message. His eyes veiled, his ears shut, and his heart, and his heart become callous. He will, and can, he will and can no longer be responsive to the gospel and to any, to any teaching as a matter of fact. And you ask, so what's the point of this mission then? The point is, God is unwilling to let go of the unwilling hearts. Because God is love and is a God of mercy. See it this way, God can either keep quiet about the depravity and immorality of the people and let them go down the road of destruction, or he sends his warning despite knowing that the message, the message of repentance will lead to further hardening and shutting of hearts. But my friends, what kind of God would allow his people to go on to ruin without efforts to forewarn? As parents of your child, you would never hands off your child's erroneous ways. What more are God, who is loving, compassionate and merciful. God is holy and just and He is compassionate. He desires the redemption of sinners. He is a loving God who refuses to give up on His people. Therefore, He sends forth His messengers to proclaim the truth. And so He called upon Isaiah. And today, He is calling you and me to go and say to the people, to be the voice in the desert, Isaiah in chapter 40 verse 3 prophesies that there will be a voice calling out in the wilderness, proclaiming the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This prophecy was later realized by John the Baptist, who lives in the desert, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Do you know that deserts are quieter than any other habitat? Even when you shout in the desert, you will not be returned with, with an echo. Getting a response from the desert is as good as whipping a dead horse, a mission that seems so futile and yet God is unwilling to forego this mission impossible. God is calling you and I to be the voice in the wilderness, to prepare the way of the Lord, to make straight in the desert a highway for our Lord Jesus Christ. Regardless of the outcome, 
God only requires that Isaiah be faithful to his mission. Regardless of the outcome, God only requires that you and I be faithful to his mission. This is always the duty of God's messengers. We are to deliver the message and reiterate it, whether men accept or reject it. Whether it is popular or unpopular is a thing of which we are not even to think of. The one thing we have to consider and remember is that it is true. Therefore, God's truth must be proclaimed. Whether men were hit or rejected, we need to keep proclaiming. Tell someone or type in the chat, God's truth must be proclaimed. Then Isaiah said, Lord, how long? By this, Isaiah is asking, for how long is he going to keep doing this? And the Lord answered in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 12, Until cities are devastated and without, in, and without inhabitant, and houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed his people far away, and there are many deserted places in the midst of the land. This entire mission seems endless. Imagine how Isaiah felt when this mission is delivered to him. He has enthusiastically volunteered himself into a gloomy mission. On one hand, we all understand that God has called us to fruitfulness, that we are to bear fruit. On the other, when we do not see any fruits, we become disheartened. And this is normal. You are perfectly normal when you feel that way. Because only a person who cares about the mission questions and reflects on his progress. A person who is least bothered will not be affected even if he fails. Just as God is telling Isaiah, God is saying this to us today. I demand nothing but your faithfulness. I demand nothing but your devotion and undivided service. God says, I only require that you faithfully proclaim exactly what I tell you. Nothing more, nothing less. God requires us to remain faithful in our position. Say to someone or type in, and, or type in the chat, God requires us to remain faithful in our position. God requires us to remain faithful in our position. Just like the Saraf who are attending to the Lord, we are to attend to God with the same devotion and dedication. Now, the other meaning of the word attending in Hebrew, amat, also means to endure, to persist, and be steadfast. We only need to be faithful and steadfast to God's mission. Whether you are called to plant or water, though the outcome is important, leave the outcome to the Lord, just as 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 5 to 9 say. After all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We are only God's servant through whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work of the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one, and the one who waters work together with the same purpose, and both will be rewar rewarded for their own hard work. For we are both God's workers, and you are God's field. You are God's building. Now, my friend, he who plants and he who waters are one and in, in importance and esteem, working towards the same purpose, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, his servants working together. Therefore, be faithful to the assignment God has appointed to each of you and know that at the end of the day, God is the one who will cause the increase and growth. But maybe some of us here is finding it a grind to be the voice in the desert. After all, it has been a long time. The growth is slow. The evidence of fruitfulness is little. Just like Isaiah, we are asking the Lord, For how long? For how long are we going to continue proclaiming? For how long are we going to be that voice in the desert without a return of a slightest echo? God says, until the people have come to an end and nowhere to turn but to God. Before that happens, 
we as his messengers must keep proclaiming, keep saying, keep preaching, keep teaching, and keep praising. So does it mean that our mission will really end up fruitless and wasted? My friends, though it seems like a laborious and difficult mission, God will never leave us to labor in vain. And just as 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, always doing your best and doing more than is needed, being continually aware that your labor, even, even to the point of exhaustion in the Lord, is not futile, not wasted. It is never without purpose. The Lord told Isaiah that there will be a tent, a remnant of holy people who will survive. Like a terebinth or oak, or oak tree, though cut down but with the stump, it will grow into a tree again. It will stand the test and test of time. There will be a tent who will emerge. Just like Isaiah chapter 10 verses 21 and 21, uh, 20 and 21 described, in that day, the remnant left in Israel, the survivors in the house of Jacob, will no longer depend on allies who seek to destroy them. But they will faithfully trust the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. A remnant will return. Yes, the remnant of Jacob will return to the mighty God. Nothing that the Lord has assigned us to complete is ever wasted. It is never without purpose. Yes, the process, the journey can be difficult, can be disheartening, can be discouraging at times. Being the voice in the desert is challenging, but we can always be hopeful. We can be hopeful because God will never leave the unfaithful, uh, will never leave the faithful unnourished. He will never forsake the faithful. He will preserve the faithful. He will renew the strength and the, and the, the, the strength of his faithful ones. He delights in his faithful and he will never desert you when you call upon him. There are many brave soldiers in the Lord out there, of the, uh, there are many brave soldiers of the Lord out there who are constantly facing danger and risking their lives sharing the gospel. Our affairs of life challenges should not be more troubling than theirs. Yet they never give up. Therefore, church, let's continue to run this race knowing that God is with us. Is with his people. Now let's read the following scriptures from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 together. It will be quite a read, but I want to encourage you to let the word of God sink deep into your heart as you read. Let's go. Therefore, since God in his mercy has given us this new way or ministry, we never give up. We reject all shameful deeds and underhanded methods. We don't try to trick anyone or distort the word of God. We tell the truth before God, and all who are honest know this. If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded their minds, the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay, jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Though suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus, so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, 
but this has resulted in eternal life for you. But we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith the psalmist had had when he said, I believe in God, so I spoke. We know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! Now let's take a few seconds to praise His name in your own way. Yes, God, we thank you. We thank you that you are holy. We thank you, O oh Lord God, that we can serve you because it is an honor. We thank you, O oh Lord Jesus, O oh Father, that we can be here right now, this moment, saying, Here I am, send me, because we can be available to do that. And indeed, my friends, I mentioned earlier that Saraf means the burning ones, the fiery ones. Their names denotes fervor and zeal. The Saraf burn with love to God. The Saraf are on fire for God. They are always ready to attend to the Lord. We wing up in humility, adoration, devotion, love, and execution for the Lord. You who have experienced His grace, met the Holy God, will wing up like Saraf, will burn in love and passion for Him and for His work. You will be like the Saraf, kindling and igniting your fire for our God. Love undivided as you have been redeemed. Serve steadfastly as you have been called. Preach relentlessly as you have been commissioned. Teach unapologetically the truth as you have been taught. My friends, as we enter into Christmas and very soon a new year, I pray that we are resolute to be on fire for our holy God. Amen. <music>